Oh, what should we do for introduction? It's a vague teaching on the influences of black metal. I think I'll stop like around 90 because <clears throat> that's a whole different ballgame. But first I'm going to take it into the 80s. Okay? <clears throat> From first song on first Black Sabbath. Because it goes like dun, dun, dun. and when I make riffs, I made riffs for uh, the last start on album now, I still use <clears throat> those notes like sort of bass for a lot of the riffs and a lot of people have been using that <clears throat> to make the grim or even eerie sound and that song just plays deliberately on that particular riff on, from most of the song, so a spooky cover to boot. <coughs> Moving on to maybe not the typical, but let's just include the uh, motorhead for good taste. <coughs> We have has had some uh, Motorhead parts in, in Darktron and I have heard no complaints, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> some tougher bands of the 80s that I will come to has also used some Motorhead, like Bulldozer from Italy, I guess, for one. And, uh, then we of course reach, we can have like, okay. And then Venom, of course. I'm doing this simple, simple now because we basically just have this from the 70s. <clears throat> also a lot of metal people tend to be my age or a little bit older or a lot younger, and we were just tiny, tiny tots at the time. We didn't really venture into the obscure. Uh, Venom, the oldies favorite, of course. <clears throat> uh, but still popular with lots of younger kids. Um, because it's popular with the, the older ones, I guess. They want to find some essence there. <clears throat> From Venom, I guess there were a lot of people um, hooking on to that imagery. We had like, of course, Judas Priest too, uh, looking a bit tough, you know, leathering up and all that shit. Venom <clears throat> started using the whole satanic gimmickry and it got a lot of people starting uh, from the likes of Metallica, I guess, were huge Venom fans, to the likes of the more obscure bands that popped up. Venom had <coughs> rotten production and it's a lot of people just frowned at it, you know, what the hell is this? So it was sort of excluding, <clears throat> whereas Judas Priest excluded, of course, the rest of the world, but all the people into rock and the heavy shit like Judas Priest. I guess Venom was one of the bands that really divided <coughs> some of the metal scene. I mean, in attitude and uh, also taste. But there were rock in production, sure. You could say even lo fi. Uh, 
Satanic imagery. Of course, the leather and the some swords were there, and uh, you know the whole. Leather and spike package. Uh, mythical, let's call it stage names. <laughs> Alias. Of course, it went on to become the Mighty Mouse. Excellent writing there. Um, Now in uh, in the states, uh, there was this thrash metal emerging <clears throat> from the aftermath of the new wave of British heavy metal, the <clears throat> Novo, and uh, the Americans had Metallica sums it up because it was metallic. <clears throat> At the same time, you had this more beats me why. But from Europe, you had bands wanting to make the same metallic music, but they ended up sounding more obscure and more obscure lyrics, totally into the occult thing. <clears throat> Destruction. And... Uh, Sodom. I think the links between Venom and Sodom are really obvious if you can listen to their early material of Sodom. <coughs> um, could also include the creator, but they moved away from the occult pretty quickly, but they used to be called Tormentor, and they, it was... <coughs> They looked like proper European metalheads at the time. You know. Not so influenced by Venom, but later on came bands like Merciful Fate. Early 90s black metal parties in Norway always played early Merciful Fate. There was no skipping on that, I can tell you. It was mandatory. <coughs> released at least two excellent albums um, with uh, focus on occult lyrics, uh, being pretty serious about that. Music was in the aftermath of new wave of British metal, like excellent musician and all that, but uh, still first commercial <laughs> fate album, pretty shabby. <coughs> few points regarding Merciful Fate, actually. The seriousness of the lyrics, especially for me in the second for Merciful Fate album, <coughs> sort of converted me into <coughs> the whole satanic approach. I don't really think uh, uh, early creator demo convinced a lot of people or made them think a lot about the subject, but he's uh, bringing some Lavean aspects into it, which was, which is 
well now and 10 years ago it was more of a discussed subject there was almost a dividing factor even in either you were Lovain or you were not <clears throat> The initial idea of black metal from the likes of Hieronymus really, he did not exclude Merciful Fate, but he uh, did not want black metal to be a Lavean thing. He thought that black metal had, had nothing to do with that at all. I, I guess I'm, um, <clears throat> I can agree with it, but still Merciful Fate, they don't exactly have a, had a lost, they don't have a lot to to answer for they they did great shit. Um, so they enjoy doing this so much. Possessed. Yeah, Slayer. Huge, huge point. Um, it was about the same time here. Of course. Can I, like, wipe that shit out? Well, attitude-wise, I'm definitely say first slayers black metal because their thrash at the time that they were probably attempting to do was not very convincing, but it was definitely metal and it was black. One of the few, I guess, big American bands that had some cult or satanic grim or whatever lyrics and one important point is that they became huge from that fundament which they started uh, <clears throat> in the scene at that time it was normal when a band became Big, like Slayer. The lyrics grow more conventional. It was a, a thing in the 80s scene that was often discussed about wimping out both musically and lyrically. I don't think Slayer did that. Slayer has still huge respect. Big. Um, but there were, uh, there were um, an ear opener because they started using all those uh, half note riffs that became death metal. Um, but still, they, they look fucking black. And when, when uh, Slayer had that fucking video live, I'm talking about the entire Europe, European television, music television. The first meeting with Slayer was live. Fucking evil sounding. I shit they not. And raw. Uh, 
And I guess if you liked it, you were onto something. You were hearing death metal <clears throat> without really knowing it. Possessed call themselves death metal, but uh, <laughs> they didn't really invent anything there. They just played metal slash thrash metal with the usual occult frame. Death metal is really a way to play. Like most people would say, Norwegian black metal or black metal now is a certain way of playing riffs. Well, I'm trying to show <clears throat> why Norwegian black metal became what it became. All the influences are here. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Battery. <clears throat> I guess they uh, <laughs> quickly convinced at least 80% of Venom's early fans. That was a lot. And they were pretty much alone in the world doing what sounded like a speeded up Venom demo tape. And it was released and I guess the uh, distribution was huge. And for uh, people into these things, uh, when they saw battery, that was just a cling on. Sure. <laughs> I'm digging this. <clears throat> I was young at the time. I, I didn't catch it like this. I had to see it in retrospect. But I'm, uh, <clears throat> I guess, uh, I won't have a lot of people saying against me. You should have, maybe have an older guy here that has seen everything saying, that's correct, Fenris. Oh, Fenris, I don't know about that one, but I'm running the show here. <clears throat> Battery. Um, also, at the same time, bands like Mayhem popping up. Um, we gotta go here with Battery, I guess. Battery. <laughs> it's beautiful just to ride it. Biggest, biggest inspiration on the Norwegian scene and probably globally oh, like a, as well sped, sped up Venom a demo and then later rather quickly added Atmosphere. We had enough metal from before. So Battery mysteriously added this atmosphere to it, furthermore dividing the metal scene into, well, huh. this ain't metal, but it's sure as hell, <laughs> obscure. And the people that went with Bathory, I guess, uh, had to end up in the black metal 90s <clears throat> rally. Next step around 88 from the uh, late 80s, they include <laughs> the whole Viking.
pagan vibe. Also a big hit, <coughs> as we've seen in the 90s. Uh, so as we see from the facts here, it's clear that Bathory, in my eyes, uh, it's really the most important band. He also had the very raspy, witchy vocals. <clears throat> Let's go back, I gotta have some perspective here. <laughs> Rasping, nah, nah, nah. <clears throat> Pretty restless. I don't know. <laughs> At the same time, uh, on this time we had more metal fucked up bands like Bulldozer, I guess. Um, I guess Root from the East block probably happened around here. I'm not too sure. I've been uh, skipping some Root classes, <coughs> you might say. We're nearing into 1986 <coughs> now, which is probably my favorite year of metal altogether. But we gotta focus on black metal. Uh, when I've come this far, when I've come this far as Bathory, uh, then web is starting to <laughs> unfold clearly. When you listen to the first Bathory album, the most uh, the rasping voice is probably the one that you will hear uh, from the. Norwegian sound in the 90s trend that you will hear most similarities to. <clears throat> the second Bathory album is extremely obscure uh, sounding. This one was more like Venomish rock and roll. They're moving away from it on the second album. And then they're dropping the third Bathory album, which carries most similarities to the 90s scene of all albums of the 80s. Uh, Album. <laughs> this is where the audience should go, duh! <laughs> <clears throat> Number one essential album. I think I'm through with my three. All these bands have released albums. Now in the underground, you get into the underground by, I don't know, maybe a record store where people writing fan scenes, try to sell their fan scenes to the guy in there at the counter. That's how I got it. And then, boom, you're into the fucking underground. And then there's lots of bands, myriads of uh, occult bands that have been influenced by all these <coughs> throughout the 80s, which has also been important for myself. I could mention Poison from Germany, uh, that never made it, I just had to quit. I should have talked a little bit more, but this is just an example. I can take some others. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah, obscurity from Sweden. <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> really 
demonic, if I may say so, sounding band from Australia, Slaughter Lord. Let's say we're, we're t talking starting 85, 86. We have albums out by uh, Slaughter from Canada. That's strictly for connoisseurs, actually, but uh, hugely uh, inspired by uh, Celtic Frost. That's important. Not a lot of bands were actually. <laughs> actually, early Napalm Death was Celtic Frost inspired. <clears throat> You have um, Middle Europe, I uh, know the, the, the Middle American scene. I'm just kidding, of course. No bands from Honduras that I know of released anything at the time, but uh, you had South America early Sepultura. Yeah, let's include them. Don K of uh, the Death Vine column in Kerrang at the time said that they had a sound that would turn flowers black. Not an extreme metaler with a... <clears throat> well, anyone, any extreme metal with pride would check them out then. Of course, you couldn't get it in the store, you had to write it to send money to get it early support show. Then one of the absolutely <sighs> finest <laughs> bands to like, even nowadays, for the old school, or if you're a new, new school kid and like this. Sarcophago, first album, Inri, get it if you can, get it while you can. <clears throat> I mean, at this time, 85, 86, 87, we had thrash metal peaking, death metal starting. Uh, first death metal album. Let's just say that the first death metal album was Death, first death album, out in 87. You can imagine the trend always comes four years, five years after the Initial. King Diamond, of course, had his paint. Uh, Mayhem used corpse paint, I guess, later when they got dead from Morbid. Uh, Morbid was a Swedish band at the time. Actually, we could have like a fist. <clears throat> paint. There wasn't much paint. Photos you have of some of these bands aren't very clear. <laughs> it's pretty obscure, some of it, but they uh, luckily grown to be become cult acts nowadays. <clears throat> Damn, I was onto something, but I forgot. Well, you have uh, 87 starts pop up things like Dark Troll, <laughs> <clears throat> Rotten Christ from. Uh, from Greece. But uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this as a main band from Greece, but the Greek actually had mostly occult acts and very poorly always produced, not with any force behind it. And there was quickly established a sound that would later be called the Greek sound, had a sound of their own. It wasn't like Italia had the sound of their own. Greek sound existed. We have a Greek sound, Swedish sound, Norwegian sound, <laughs> not Danish sound. <coughs> Let's say, it's a, oh, have we forgot some countries then? England, we might as well include the 
uh, onslaught. Quartet, hot though. Time of 86, there were almost no uh, trash pans with that. <coughs> Occult bag. 87 had, uh, 86, 87 had Sabbath from England starting up with some pentagrams thrown in for good measure and pretty <coughs> anti Christian lyrics. I also have Sabbath from Japan, which <laughs> is still going, but they're little rebels, little warriors. I'll use this one now. Can I? Oops. Here we have the East Block, two big bands. Uh, it was, uh, of course, Tormentor from Hungary. <coughs> and um, Master's Hammer. Ma'am. as well. No, I, I can't write unexplainable anymore, but <clears throat> what? <Yes. laughs> that doesn't look right. Unexplainable grimace started out in uh, 84, I guess, around there. <clears throat> and it was the only Norwegian band, so it's sort of special for, for us. Uh, later came vomit, but mayhem. We're talking about let's talk about mayhem. They really they had huge problems uh, in the late 80s when bands like Us and Emperor and uh, Cadaver was starting to buck up for the big metal battle. <clears throat> but still, they released the Death Crush Mini and they just lived on reputation only in the late 80s. Uh, I went to rehearsals and came like awestruck back and uh, I did show in a uh, show in like 89 which is legendary. <coughs> Dead with the corpse paint and all. Uh, got the corpse paint started in again. Let's say, let's just call it a corpse paint. Revival. <laughs> Sarcophago. Use corpse paint. And they're fucking from Brazil. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. In its in itself, uh, in himself was, it's like an aspect to me. Man. <clears throat> you want to include? Uh, he was keeping a lot of the occult scene. I guess he was one of the people that kept all these sort of these bands together and all the obs other obscure bands in the underground. Because what I'm describing here is not a musical style. It's a different. Bands that has something to do with sounds, a lot of them totally different, has something to do with metal, something to do with obscurity, something to do with the occult. <clears throat> so there's no style, so there's no, no people buying it. You know, like death metal was starting to get big here, thrash metal was selling shitloads. Like, 
didn't have anyone buying this stuff, so there was an underground thing. <clears throat> Euromus plus I have to say that they invented the typical Norwegian black metal riff. It was sort of, it sort of derived from Bathory, but it was a new way of playing a riff that was, uh, had really not been done and not been stylized by anyone before. That's what Snorri and um, Jonas did, and uh, to my knowledge, they did this in 89. Well, you have a chord and you have fuss, but you sort of, you don't play one and one, you play one and one, up and down. And you have the notes cling together so that it, you have the fucking eerie notes and they all stream together, creating a f this incredible <coughs> eerie sound. Like, it sends fucking chills down your spine if you're, if you're uh, able to adapt it. Darkroom were at this time, 88, 89. We had gone the route from uh, getting into the underground via, via Slayer, getting all this uh, stuff, but uh, we were following the, the metal wind, if one could say. Start playing thrash, onto playing death, and a lot of these groups aren't really what we call typical typical death metal that came from America. <clears throat> that was what we played. And uh, the whole, a lot of the scene, both underground and overground scene, was uh, pretty death metal based at this time. <clears throat> I would just want to say the reason why I started to listen to this shit again for the second time and then understanding it differently. Hieronymus, of course, understood this the whole uh, time through because it was older than me. And, Cut it all the way. I came in here, had to go there. One summer I was listening to a death metal compilation tape. One song by Tormentor there. That was not death metal, but it was like all this. Just <clears throat> mid-80s, all together, one song. Made me say, what the fuck am I doing? Why am I listening to death metal? This is it. I'm taking out my old albums. And from there, I just started listening to that. And then I started... At the time, I, I of course knew what name was doing, but we were really involved in the death metal thing. But from there on, I started listening to this shit again, and I started getting more interested in um, talking to people that were into the same shit. Therefore, we started later hanging around Mayo a bit more. <clears throat> so Tormentor, 89, turned my fucking head again. <clears throat> on to the 90s. Just say nine, let's be kind. <clears throat> Mayhem, the black metal riff, Mayhem starts making new songs, uh, which has these riffs. Uh, basically, Mayhem was the, the first Norwegian black metal band in, in the the forefront, the, uh, the avant chord.
around 91 or something, uh, or 90, Mayhem uh, releases a live album, which we could safely say is the first Norwegian black metal album. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people says it's uh, our second album, Blaze Northern Sky. Some people say it's the first person, but uh, it's basically wrong. Live in Leipzig for Mayhem is the first. <clears throat> I say, man, in 91, when uh, Hieronymus opened up shop, there really weren't a lot of bands apart from this going for the black metal sound. Of course, I have like later on. It's time battery was still sort of going but uh, had no black metal appeal left <clears throat> started losing track in 93 something like that um, I'd be uh, like away from the scene for uh, a year and then uh, not really listening to what other people did and then I made like uh, Riffs for the Transylvanian Hunger album and stuff. Sigurd told me, like, well, you know, it's okay, but uh, everyone else is doing this now. Um, are they? God damn it! <laughs> the Norwegian black metal riff had, like, exploded. Everyone's making their version of it. <clears throat> Basically, 93 stuff, yeah. It starts to get shady from here, I'm telling you. So I'm not going, going to go into that. I'm just calling it the myriads, and that's it. But at the time here, we really had no press at all. It was just this Norwegian click and we were all... <laughs> listening to all that, more or less, give or take a few bands for... And that's why we had a similar sound. After almost actually was starting a label, it was probably cool for like uh, 80 people around the world. <clears throat> like really globally, because it's always been global. <clears throat> you almost made a big point by having a huge map in his office, having pins in the map from where he had contacts. Always want to have contacts in Africa and shit like that. He craved that. The, the quality of the music, for instance, was not important for him as long as it were from a troubled situation that uh, was, it was 
supposed to be, uh, be like a struggle to be a metal or it should be hated. Important. I'm, I'm feeling like I've complete when I'm feeling like I'm going to feel when I complete the doctrine album. One huge chore that's I feel sliding off my shoulders now. <laughs> yeah.